<laughs> you beat me to it. <laughs> Thank you. We and are we're recording. recording. We are recording. So I will call the, I'm calling the April 30th, 2024 meeting of the Community Resources Committee to order. And I will, we'll go around and say if we can hear and be heard. So let's start with Pat. Present. Um, Councillor Haneke. We can't hear you. Present. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Pam Rooney. I'm here. Okay, and um, we hope that Councillor uh, Etet will be joining us shortly. So pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by chapter 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by chapter two of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Uh, no in-person attendance of members of the public is possible, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via techn technological means. So um, I, again, am, oh, hello, Councillor Ete. We just called the meeting to order, and can you hear us and be heard? Hi, President. Okay, welcome. Great. We are literally just getting started. Um, Ham may jump jump in as chair in a few moments, but if you can see, she's in a car right now. So um, I will begin chairing the meeting. So our first um, item is public comment, but I'm not, oh, I am seeing one member in the audience. So I will now um, open the meeting to public comment. If any member of the public would like to speak, please raise your hand and we'll invite you in. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands go up. So I think we will end public comment and we can come back at the end of the meeting if um, a member of the audience, um, you know, has a question or, or would like to speak. So we're um, the first item on our agenda is a report on regulations um, versus bylaws and a discussion of our workflow and rollout of the bylaw. And we're delighted that Chris Brestroff and Stephanie Ciccarella could be here to provide um, an update because I think you've you've done some work on this since our last meeting. So I will turn it over to you, Chris and Stephanie. Okay, um, good evening. My name is Christine Brestrup. I'm the planning director and I have with me Stephanie Ciccarella, the director of sustainability. And we spent time last week um, at, based on your directions from the previous meeting, I should back up and say, we have met with you twice now. We met with you on March 26th, and then we met with you on April 9th. In the interim, we also met with um, Councillor Haneke, um, and she had some ideas about how to uh, reorganize this um, solar bylaw. So um, we took some cues from what she said, and we met with you, as I said, on April 9th and gave you um, kind of a picture of what we were proposing to do. And you essentially um, agreed with it uh, to that point. Um, and well, what we decided to do that was that there were uh, many, many things in the solar bylaw, and um, you all felt that it would be clearer and more useful if we... Um, could separate those things out into different categories. And among those categories were, we're going to have to present this to town council at some point. So a cover memo, what is this all about? Why are we doing this, et cetera? Um, a solar bylaw, and this would be part of the zoning bylaw. So it has to have the same characteristics as the zoning bylaw. Um, and rules and regulations. Now, the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board both have rules and regulations. And um, several members of the CRC felt that uh, parts of the um, solar bylaw, the way it had been um, initially drafted, um, contained a lot of uh, items in it that should more properly be in rules and regulations. And then the other part is um, conditions. So when the 
planning board or the zoning board of appeals grants a permit, they put uh, conditions on that permit. And usually we have what we call boilerplate conditions. So um, for, you know, say a residential development, we have certain conditions that we always put in. For a commercial development, we have certain conditions that we always put in. So we're trying to develop some boilerplate conditions for um, solar installations. So um, as I said, Stephanie and I um, met last week and we um, went through the bylaw as it was written and we um, determined what we thought should be in these various categories. And Stephanie was very uh, colorful. And um, <laughs> as you can see, I don't know if you can see this, but um, somebody can, can bring this up on the screen. Uh, our version of the solar bylaw, um, which we've divided into sections. And maybe it would be good to kind of just skim through this and give you a general um, idea of what our thought process was. Um, so if someone can bring the large scale ground mounted solar, solar photovoltaic installations up on the screen and the colored version, which I think Stephanie called the highlighted version, that would be helpful. So what we did was we d divided this based on color into these four categories, which we developed. Um, the cover memo was one category. The bylaws sections was another category. Rules and regulations was a third category and conditions was a fourth category. So we assigned different colors to these different um, parts of the bylaw. Um, a cover, the cover memo was going to be green. And so things that are um, in green, highlighted in green here, are we think should be in the cover memo as opposed to being part of the solar bylaw. Um, things that are in yellow, we believe should be um, left in the solar bylaw itself. Um, if you can scroll down and see if you can find some blue, um, I think blue is not too far. How far is blue? There we go. Okay, so things that are um, highlighted in blue, we thought would most practically be in rules and regulations. And that includes things like submittal requirements. And then things that are in pink, and I can't remember where the pink is. There it is. Okay, so things that are in pink, we felt that those would be most suitably um, offered as boilerplate conditions to the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board for them to use when they're um, reviewing and approving a solar installation. So um, we can go through the this document here that is um, highlighted and give you kind of a sense of why we put things in various categories, starting at the top, if that makes sense to you. Although I'm happy to, I'm open-minded about what, however you think it would be uh, best to review this. Okay, so um, thank you for this. The color is great. I think that's very helpful, although it didn't come through on what was in the packet. Did it come through for anybody else? Oh, it did. I yeah, mine through there. Still this is this is from the packet it's the pdf okay i must have been looking at the wrong one because i didn't yeah it's what it's i had PDF. was just all white okay okay i'm glad it's there and it's uh pam um it came through the in the packet but it wasn't able to be printed in color and i also need to let you know that my since i'm in a car i do not have a power cord so i'm just going to keep going as long as i can until the power of my computer runs out and then when we get to our destination, I will log back into the meeting. So oh. I'm apologizing. Okay. No, thank you for around eleven o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll just keep going until I can't. Thank you. Great. Um, I think what do you all think? I think it would be helpful for Chris to go through this. But I can sort of do it category by category instead of, um, you know, line by line from the beginning. Right. Uh, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that might be helpful is to go through the, bro you, you didn't remove anything. You just took what was there and highlighted it. So, yeah. so it seems to me that we might be able to go directly to the sections and look at them sectionally instead of going, I don't know, just seems more efficient, but. 
Yeah. Does that make sense to you, Chris? Yeah. Sure, that's fine. Okay. Um, so you want to start with, what do you want to start with? Um, the cover memo? Uh, Stephanie has her hand up. I was um, actually um, going to recommend that maybe focusing on the bylaw first itself might be the place to start um, because the cover memo can sort of come at the end and that was just pulled out from the existing document. But I think the solar bylaw itself is really what you wanna be focusing on maybe, just a suggestion. Sure, that's fine. That's what's in yellow. So um, does everybody agree with that, that we should start with the solar bylaw? That sounds good to me. So, okay. sorry, rather than going from this document, maybe the bylaw itself that was created. Sorry, I'm going to mute myself. Um, I didn't understand anything that was just said, but I guess I'll just go ahead and talk. I think Stephanie had suggested going through the bylaw itself and not the color-coded copy. There's there's a version, sorry, there is a version that was in your packets because what we did was we color coded the document and then we provided or Chris provided each one separately with right. the we pulled out. So there's a a version of the solar all of the yellow. That's just the, there it is. Okay. Right. Great. Okay. Yeah, it's on the screen. There you go. Okay. So Thanks. I will start with this. So um normally in a zoning bylaw, you have um, you know, sections that are sort of typical. And one of the sections is intent and purpose. So um, we took uh, the very beginning of the intent and purpose from the larger solar bylaw and um, put it in the first part of this um, document here. So this is what's going to go into the solar bylaw, in our opinion. Um, then what does this apply to? Well, the applicability section tells you that it applies to these large scale ground mounted Photo photovoltaic installations. Um, and then at the next uh, paragraph says, this bylaw is not intended to regulate solar panels installed on buildings. Such installations are permitted by right with a building permit. Um, so that's that. And then um, we had long, fairly long nexus statements in the solar bylaw initially. And the reason for that, was that um, we were told that if we had um, limitations on solar installations, it would be a good idea to have something in the bylaw that would tell people why, why are we having these limitations? And so the the solar bylaw working group developed these this text to say, well, here's why we need to have this solar bylaw. Here's why we need to um, protect forest lands and protect farmlands. So, um, so we're leaving the nexus statements in the bylaw for now. So the first nexus statement is on forest lands and protecting those and why they're valuable to us. And then the second section is on farmland and again, um, why we need to protect farmland and why it's valuable to us. Um, the next section is definitions and all zoning bylaws have definitions. Often these definitions are found in section 12 at the back of the zoning bylaw. <clears throat> and we may decide that these definitions should also be placed in section 12, but for now, or excuse me, Article 12. But for now, we're putting them in the body of the solar bylaw, and you can decide later whether you want to have them in the body here or whether you want to have them with all of the other definitions. So these are definitions that relate to uh, solar installations. Um, the next section, that's your right, it's popping up in the phone. The next section has to do with design standards. And um, we talked about that, Stephanie and I, and we decided that um, many of the design standards that were put into the original solar bylaw may be better off placed in um, the rules and regulations of the uh, particular board that is reviewing these things. So what, we le what we're left with is the one that we felt was really um, very important to put in the solar bylaw was glare and how to control glare or what should be done about glare. 
Um, then the next section, special requirements. Um, we talked a lot about uh, protecting the ecosystems and um, we talked also about setbacks with the Solar Bylaw Working Group. And so we thought that those two things should be kept in the Solar Bylaw as opposed to be putting in rules and regulations. And then special requirements for large scale ground mounted photovoltaic installations on farmland. Um, we thought that it was important to keep that in the solar bylaw for now. Um, then we have on the next page, uh, dimensional standards. So if you scroll down to the next page, you see dimensional standards and we start to talk about um, some setbacks. And, and as Mandy Joe has mentioned, there were setbacks mentioned in other parts of the bylaw, but these are ones that we felt really should be in the solar bylaw. Um, then we have a section on battery energy storage systems. And this section is really fairly short. Um, and in some ways it's kind of um, just representative of what should actually be in the bylaw. So we have a choice between either having a battery energy storage systems bylaw that stands on its own or putting one uh, together with this with the um, zoning bylaw I'm, I'm not saying that correctly we have a choice between having a solar bylaw that doesn't really talk a lot about battery energy storage and then uh, an accompanying bylaw that would talk about battery energy storage and those would be two different parts of the zoning bylaw so this is something that you need to decide um, in this case we're just showing kind of a a summary of what might be placed in battery energy storage systems in the zoning bylaw itself i think we would if we decided to keep this in the zoning bylaw we would elaborate on this um, and then the alternative choice is to create a separate section, which I have drafted, but I haven't shown it to you yet. I don't think I've, I don't believe I've sent it to you, but the Solar Bylaw Working Group did have an opportunity to look at it, although they didn't have an opportunity to talk about it. Um, so anyway, that's a decision that you'll have to make about whether you want to keep that in here or whether you want to have a separate section. Then all of the solar bylaws that I looked at had pretty much the next several sections in the solar bylaw, in the in a zoning bylaw. One of it has to do with modifications. So if you're making substantial modifications to your solar installation, um, this tells you what you need to do. Um, the transfer of ownership is also something that is typically contained in a zoning bylaw. So um, we kept the transfer of ownership. That is, if somebody builds the solar installation and then sells it off to somebody else, what happens? And what are the notification requirements? You have to notify the permit granting authority and the building commissioner, et cetera. So that's what that's about. The next section is about abandonment or decommissioning. So abandonment means, you know, that the operator kind of walks away from it. Um, decommissioning is when it reaches the end of its um, lifetime, and then you have to um, take, you know, take it apart. Um, so that's what this section is about. And again, abandonment and decommissioning are usually part of solar bylaws that I have um, reviewed. Um, if you go down to the bottom of the next page, financial security or surety, um, we often have, um, there is often a section or almost always a section in a solar bylaw um, having to do with, well, what do you do if somebody walks away from, uh, uh, from a, a site, doesn't complete building it or doesn't, um, doesn't take it apart when the time has come to, um, to take it apart. So that's why we have this section on solar on financial surety for solar uh, installations. Um, then we have a section on taxes or payment in lieu of taxes. Again, that's kind of a typical section to have in a solar bylaw. Severability means if part of the bylaw is found to be invalid, the remainder of the bylaw won't be affected. And then um, how can you appeal a decision? And this describes various ways that you can appeal different uh, types of decisions that may be made with regard to solar bylaws or solar installations. So um, so that's what we think should be kept in the solar bylaw. Do you want to talk about that um, now or do you want to 
go on to the next sections. Um, well, let me, Mandy, uh, Councilor Haneke has a question. So I'll call on Thank you. you to ask or make a comment. It, it, no, it, it is it is more of a question and I'm gonna keep it very broad um, because I, I just, you you seem to have, and I'm just trying to sort of get an idea of how you did this or how you made decisions. You seem to have taken entire sections or or sections of sections, um, thinking about design standards, all of the glare, but none of the signage. Say, um, the signage all went to regulations without modifying at this point any language or anything like that. You're just creating these new documents right now. And then I I'm, I guess my question is, the next step is to then dig into say this document and start modifying it to whatever concerns we have or addressing all of that. So that's question number one. But question number two is, did you make a distinct choice not to say split up signage into some portions that might be more appropriate for bylaw into the bylaw and then some into the regulations and said, well, we're just gonna keep entire sections into one or the other. And since that section is more regulatory, we initially put it in regulations um, or is that it, it? So should I read it like that, that some of it might migrate back into bylaw at some point? Um, or should I be looking at this and saying, none of it's gonna migrate back unless someone asks. I guess that's, that's no, sort of- I think question. that this is a fluid um, situation. Uh, Stephanie and I took our first crack at what should be in what document. And I think neither of us has a very um, rigid um, stance on what we put in the bylaw and what we put in rules and regulations. So this is all open to being discussed and I, I think, you know, signage is certainly something that we could put back into the bylaw. We thought it was applicable in, in rules and regulations, but I think you could make the argument that it, it could also go in the bylaw. The, the bylaw itself, the zoning bylaw itself, has a whole section, a whole, ch whole chapter on signage. Um, so in terms of a solar installation, the types of signage that would normally go in would be things that are uh, warning signage, or things that tell um, the fire department, for instance, what what they should do when they arrive here or where they can find things. That's another kind of signage. But another kind of signage might be um, you want to bring a school group here. And obviously, you're going to stay outside the chain link fence. But you might want them to see some interpretive signage about what they're looking at. So that's another type of signage. So I think um, I see Stephanie has her hand up, and I think she might have had stronger opinions about where signage should go. So maybe she could speak to that question. Um, Mandy, did you have a Councilor Anakin? Do you have a question before? No, I mean, I, I we don't need to get bogged down in signage. That was just an example. I was more curious. There were some sections that I read that I thought maybe the first sentence or two of the section was appropriate for, say, the bylaw, but the rest was more regulatory or conditions. And so I was trying to get, I guess my question related to, will that be teased out later? And how did you make the decision? Was it, oh, it's mostly regulatory, so we threw it into regulations, even if something might be more appropriate in the bylaw as we dig into this document further? I think that's the case, that okay. if you have certain things that you'd prefer to have in the bylaw for certain reasons, you know, we're open to that. This was a first cut. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stephanie. Um, yeah, to Mandy Joe's question, I would say that um, I think possibly with the signage especially, but um, I thought that for the solar bylaw, things could be more generally referenced. As you pointed out, Mandy Joe. there might be just a sentence, but then the rest that gets more specific could go in the regulations. But we just kind of kept that in for now. Um, to Chris's point, we just felt like, well, you sort of under, you'll get a better sense of why we pulled what we pulled for the regulatory language. Um, and if it seems like what's in the bylaw still, some of that might still be regulatory language, you might want to pull that out 
and put it with regulations. So I think we were just trying to tease it out to sort of help discern what seems more like regulatory language. Um, again, I was sort of more, when Chris and I were speaking and doing this work, we were having conversations and I was sort of feeling like that we wanted sort of more generalities to be in the bylaw and the specifics to be in the regulatory language. So I think we were just trying to show the difference of, and, and when you look at them, especially when you look at the conditions compared to the regulatory language, you can sort of get a sense of why we chose to put those in that category. So it's just to make it clearer, but by no means is this a final, it was just what we saw as an easy way to begin the process. Thank you. No, this is really helpful. I mean, it's it's kind of like you put it in tranches and then we can, you know, refine it and dig further from there. So would it be helpful to go through, um, this is to the CRC members, to go through the different sections for Chris and Stephanie to walk us through, and then we'll have a sense of what's where, and we can, you know, have a more global discussion of if we initially see items in different sections that we think might be moved. So if, I don't know if anyone has any, it seems to me that would be helpful to go through all of them, and then we'll know what's the lay of the land is, and we can go back to specific sections. So I'll turn it back over to you, Chris. Okay, so maybe the next thing we should go through is what we thought should be in rules and regulations. And again, we lumped these in together um, with um, the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals. So the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals already have rules and regulations, and those already contain requirements for various types of um, submittals, you know, whether it's a special permit application or a comprehensive permit application or whatever. So these things that were put in the submittal requirements um, initially in the draft zoning bylaw were taken from other cities and towns that had solar bylaws that had specific requirements for um, solar installations. They wanted these types of materials. And there's a lot of overlap between what's in this list and what is in, already in the Planning Board's rules and regulations. Some members of the Solar Bylaw Working Group felt pretty strongly about keeping these things here and in any event. Um, so what we did was we said, okay, well, we could take the submittal requirements out of the solar zoning bylaw and put them into the rules and regulations. And let's not get too bogged down on exactly what these submittal requirements are at this point, but just to know that that's why we put them in rules and regulations. Um, so you can scroll down. There are a lot of them. I think there are 32 of them or something like that. And there could be arguments, uh, pro and con, of why you would want certain information or why you wouldn't want certain information or why you would insist on having it. Um, then we said, um, well, design standards could also be put in rules and regulations. And this first part of design standards, visual impact, I know there are a lot of uh, arguments against having um, visual impact be a criteria or a, a, a set of rules that you would govern um, solar installation by. Some people say, well, you shouldn't worry about what it looks like because it's so important for having these things for climactic change. And there can be all kinds of arguments about whether people think these are beautiful or not. Um, but in any event, the visual impact is something that is considered by other cities and towns. And so we initially put, um, you know, uh, analysis of the visual impact and then how to kind of, I think we have some things about how to control it, but maybe it's just analysis or mitigation in the solar bylaw. But when Stephanie and I were talking about this, we said, well, maybe that could be in rules and regulations. It's It doesn't necessarily have to be in the solar bylaw. So that's why we have visual impact here. Um, fencing was another issue. You could argue that fencing should be in the solar bylaw. On the other hand, it 
make sense to put it in rules and regulations. So we made the choice to put it in rules and regulations. So that's why it's here under design standards. And then screening and planting. Um, there was a lot of talk among the solar bylaw working group members about um, how many how much screening should be around these things, whether you want to, um, you know, keep people from having to look at it or, um, you know, keep um, a, a screen between a solar installation and somebody's house. So, you know, those are all things we can talk about. But for now, we said, well, let's put screening and planting in the rules and regulations and take it out of the solar bylaw. Um, what else do we have in here? Oh, slope and soil. So we have regulations about um, how steep can you uh, install these things? What's the steepest um, property that you can install these things on? Now, there was a wide range of slopes um, that were talked about in various solar bylaws that we looked at. And in fact, I believe that the Watershed Protection Committee actually said that they could be placed on slopes of up to 30%. Um, there was a lot of discussion about that in the solar working group, and we we decided to uh, go with 15%. Um, and then soils, all existing soils should be kept on site. We have another section, I think it was in the, um, it might be in the section, talking about how do you, oh, it's right the next section, how do you um, maintain or manage soils in an area that is considered to be farmland. So the first under slope and soils here is really just saying, you really need to be careful about not taking soils off site. And if you bring soil onto the site, it has to be approved by the permit granting authority. The next section has to do with special requirements. So um, as I started to say, one of the special requirements, um, people were very concerned about, well, if you put solar installations on farmland, how do you um, keep the farmland in a state where it could be farmed in the future once the solar installation is removed? So there were um, there was a lot of material that we read about maintaining soils, and we put it in uh, the uh, rules and regulations rather than the zoning bylaw because it seemed so detailed and it seemed more um, more apt to uh, want to be put in rules and regulations. Um, and then we talked at the Solar Bylaw Working Group about, uh, let's see, next page. Um, if you scroll down to the next page where it says design and reporting requirements, um, there was a feeling that you needed to um, have a plan and be able to uh, report about um, how you were managing agri-voltaics agri on farmland. So that's what this section is about, designing and reporting requirements for agri-voltaics on farmland. Again, we felt like this was more of a specific type of requirement than um, what Stephanie had characterized as being more general description of requirements in the solar bylaw. The next section is maximization of ecosystem services. And frankly, I had never heard of ecosystem services before I met with the Solar Bylaw Working Group. It was something that um, we were trying to capture, how do you preserve and protect uh, the natural landscape and natural environment? And Dwayne Breger, who is um, very involved with solar work and also environmental work at the university, um, introduce this topic of ecosystem services. And maybe perhaps others of you had heard of this before, but it's kind of a, a big um, phrase that encompasses a lot of different things. And this, the paragraph that we're looking at at the top of the page here, ecosystem services may include, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, we have a definition of it in the definition section. So if you wanted to go back to that, we could. But anyway, this was a trying to um, describe in a general way how you protect the natural environment. Again, I hadn't heard of this before, but Duane uh, and many others had seemed to be very familiar with it. So um, let's continue on. Um, the next is stormwater management and erosion and sedimentation control. This was something that we initially had in the solar bylaw, zoning bylaw, but um, when Stephanie and I 
had our discussion, we decided that it would be better placed in rules and regulations. And there are a lot of different documents here that are referred to, and some of them are specifically um, related to Massachusetts. In fact, I think the first um, group of them are specifically Massachusetts. And then there are other things that people brought into our um, brought to our uh, knowledge that seem to be helpful. So we put those in um, into the solar bylaw, but now we're saying, well, it probably makes more sense to have these in rules and regulations as um, references or as resources for people who, you know, want to make sure that they're doing the right thing. Um, the if, next if, section. If I could, I just wanted to let the group know, I, I am going to jump over to the regional school committee meeting. I think Mandy and Jennifer are the co-hosts now, so you should be fine and I'll see you in a little while. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Thank her. you. Okay, maybe we'll see you later. Bye. Thanks. Okay, continue. <laughs> the next section is protection of drinking water supplies. And a lot of this came from the Water Supply Protection Committee white paper. So if you scroll down to the bottom of that page, um, there it is. Yeah, so there were there was a, a lot of this. There was probably a, a, almost a page about um, what we need to do to make sure that Drinking water supplies are not impacted by having um, solar installations you know, constructed near them or operated near them. Um, I think all of these were taken from, most of them were taken from the water supply protection. Committee. And those seem to be, again, specific requirements. And so it made more sense to put them in the rules and regulations than it did to leave them in the zoning bylaw. Um, then uh, the last two sections that we suggested to put in the rules and regulations, if you can scroll down again, um, would be maintenance and reporting. So maintenance is, you know, obviously maintaining it in good condition. Um, and the owner or operator is responsible for maintaining it. And you can't use any cleaners that are um, not to that are toxic. And so that again, it's really a specific requirement that made more sense to put into the rules and regulations. And reporting, um, I think we have other sections in the bylaw that talk about reporting too, but um, this is really um, reporting during construction and then reporting after construction. And who do you report to? Well, during construction, you report to the building commissioner and then you have sometimes you have large scale storm events. So you report to a list of others, um, talks about, uh, then, then there's on the next page, there's a reference to post construction and what kind of reporting are you required to submit um, after you've constructed the project and then um, you know while it's operating. And there was a feeling on the part of the solar bylaw working group that it was important to have this reporting post-construction because um, everything might not be completely stabilized and you would want to be able to know if there were problems with erosion or sedimentation. And we heard from um, people who are knowledgeable about solar installations that although they do come out at least once a year to um, assess how the, how the installation is operating, um, it would be worthwhile to have someone have to report to the town about these things and not just rely on them coming out once a year. Um, and then the last paragraph has to do with an annual report that they must submit. So the, obviously the reporting seemed to be more related to rules and regulations than to the bylaw in general. Um, are there any questions about that? Um, you know, I think I'm gonna turn over to Pam. Are you there? to Thank continue you. chairing. So Pam, yeah, we, um, Chris has walked through the bylaw section and we're just finishing the rules and regulation. But right. I did see that Councillor Haneke and Pat have their hands up, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you now to take over the reins. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Um, Councillor Haneke. Thank you. Um, Some of this 
that you decided to put into rules and regulations, while it's very specific, seems more like requirements for building than a rule like on application. So I guess when I was thinking rules and regulations, I'm thinking, well, what do you have to submit for an application? That, that submission requirement doesn't necessarily tell you whether you can build or not build in a certain area. But when I look at some of these that you've chosen for rules and regs, um, you know, LGPIs shall be constructed outside of a 400 foot buffer zone from a public water supply. Well, that that seems more to me like a bylaw requirement because you, you if the bylaw doesn't have that in there, then you can build in the 400 buffer, I would think, because a rule can't create, I've never thought of a rule or regulation as being able to create an additional requirement that isn't in the bylaw for whether it can be approved or not. And I was just zooming through the current planning board and ZBA rules and regulations, and they talk about submittal requirements as a big one, or how the hearing is going to be held. Um, you know, or or the timing potentially of appeals, but I'm not sure that was in there, but how many members are on the board, how the board elects its chair, um, not really as a bylaw sort of thing, yet I look at some of these that you chose to put into rules and regs, and they modify potentially some of the things that you kept in the bylaw, setbacks. And I'm not sure that's appropriate. So I guess I'm I'm looking for more of a, how would this be legal under state law to put in a rule and reg if the bylaw doesn't authorize it? Um, and wouldn't some of it be better for a bylaw because it just seems more bylaw-like. I'm, I'm not stating myself very clearly, but... Um, <laughs> So I would say, again, um, it's fairly fluid, and I was kind of taking my some of my clues from the wetlands um, situation. The wetlands people just came up with a new bylaw having to do with wetlands, but then they also have rules and regulations having to do with wetlands. So maybe Stephanie would be a better person to... Um, elaborate on how rules and regulations and bylaw uh, operate in the world of the Conservation Commission. Stephanie, do you, want, do you want to do that now? Um, sure. Well, I can just respond. Um, I, I am not familiar with their recent process. I can only speak to previous experience. Um, but in my mind, there may be a general statement about buffer zones and setbacks that may refer to the regulations for the specifics. So I think, again, we really weren't, we were just trying our best to parcel this out, but it's by no means exact. So I wouldn't look at leaving this in as you know, in regulations is why isn't this in the bylaw? It could go back in the bylaw. I think that's what we're saying is at this point, we've separated it enough to identify the differences in the, the language of the regulations versus the bylaw. So if you think something should go back in the bylaw, by all means, we're just trying to make this a little bit easier for you. Um, because the comment that we got initially was that the bylaw as presented initially was just too much and there was inconsistency in in the language especially compared to the other bylaws that we have for the community so i think you know to chris's point it's fluid and if you want to take this out we're not we're not recommending i want to be clear that chris and i are not recommending this as this should be the final we're just trying to make it easier for you to work with this document that was presented to you without changing the language. So that's why we didn't change anything. We just wanted to sort of put it in a format that might be easier for you to digest. 
Thank you. And I think that's exactly what was asked of them is to just do the do the parsing out, the breaking out without any editing. Um, and and Mandy, your your comment is right on that that is the discussion that needs to take place. Um, it is it is not necessarily a given that that you know it'll go as as colored at the moment. Uh, Councillor Ete. Thank you, uh, Christine and um, Stephanie. I think what you say makes sense. So this is not a question. Maybe it's just to reiterate what you've mentioned. We had this bulk document and different things seem to have been mixed in them. But right now, there has been a separation and the separation isn't completely distinct or set in stone. And so we can, at this point, if we want to, focus on the bylaw and bring in things, of course, toss things out of the bylaw as we see fit, but bring in things perhaps from the regulations that might be more appropriate in the bylaw. Would that be correct? Okay. Thank you. So I wanted to say that if we have time this evening, maybe we could go back through this rules and regulations and choose things that we think should actually be in the bylaw. I think that would be very helpful for us for the next step. Jennifer. Um, yeah, this is extremely helpful. So thank you, Stephanie and Chris, for you know, all the time you spent going through this. Um, but so I just wanted to, to uh, I guess, clarify for myself that what's in the rules and regulations, that would be up for the permit granting authorities, I guess mostly the ZBA and the planning board, this would be a recommendation and they would decide if they wanted to adopt them, but it's they could also choose not to, and then it wouldn't be part of the, the rules and regulations or the bylaw. That's I'm correct. Yeah, they, they choose whether to have them in their rules and regulations or not. Um, and may I just say one more thing? Many of these things are things that the planning board or the zoning board of appeals would review while they're reviewing um, a site plan that would be presented to them. So um, if you go down to the next uh, section that we had said could be the, the drinking water, um, this one, yeah, this drinking water one. Um, so the planning board would look at a plan and say, well, is the installation inside or outside of the 400 foot buffer zone um, when they're reviewing it. And I think, I think Mandy's point was really that the rules and regulations are more about the process of filing an application and the process of reviewing the application rather than the specifics of the application itself. And I think I understand that point and that's a good point. So even though, you know, it, it would enter into the process that the board would look at is this thing inside or outside of the 400 foot buffer zone um, having it in the zoning bylaw may make more sense because that's the that's the actual rule that would be able to be um, upheld in court whether it is or is not in in the proper location so i think i'm on i think i understand what mandy's point is and and i would be happy to uh you know have that conversation this chunk really shouldn't be here. It should be in the bylaw. Yeah. Jennifer. So if we want anything that we want to ensure is followed or stated has to be in the bylaw. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this might be a time just to, to tangent just a little bit of before, before Councillor Haneke asks your question, um, just a, a um, it might be helpful before we decide is something a, a rule and regulation or is something a bylaw. Um, I, I would appreciate uh, just a five minute conversation about where something, some item, section 17.11, where that might end up if it became a rule and regulation. And in my mind, there are a couple of options. One, it would be a solar rules and regulations. Number two, it might be under the ZBA rules and regulations. Um, 
it, it I would I would love some feedback from especially from Chris in um, in just placement. So before we start dispersing things widely, where would they end up, and who would who would manage them, who would regulate them? Well, I think if they did end up in the rules and regulations, each board, this this planning board and the ZBA would need to have a section of their rules and regulations that deals with solar. Just like the the ZBA now has a section of its rules and regulations that deal with comprehensive permits. So yeah. it would be a section of their um, rules and regs. And I, I think, I may be wrong about this, but I think that once this group decides what things should be in the rules and regulations, I think that both boards will be um, inclined to take the suggestions or the recommendations of this group because they haven't really studied um, this topic to the extent that, you, that you're studying it or that Stephanie and I studied it with the Solar Bylaw Working Group. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Haneke. Thank you. Um, two, two things. One comment, sort of one question, and I'm, I'm just using this protection of drinking water supplies as one example, because um, it's sitting here on the screen. Um, and and I think I think one of the struggles is, hence my first question when we were looking at the bylaw side, was some of these bullet points, and there's probably 10 to 15 of them, they're not even all on our page, right? Probably are more zoning bylaw logical, and others are more regulation facing. And I think that's that was the tough part of you saying which part do we put that in because maybe the buffer zones or should be bylaw, but the plan needs to meet X might be that, that you have to submit a plan, right? That might be more regulation um, and what that plan has to include, right? Um, but yet they're all in this one section. So that's more of a comment of I, I don't think and, and that's probably where you all struggled <laughs> is where is is it as a whole more regulatory but now we have to pull out the zoning stuff and plop it back in zoning or was it more zoning and then we have to pull out the regulatory stuff and plop it into the regulations. My question is at what point in this process something like protection of drinking water supplies we have a drinking water or Water Supply Protection Commission. I don't know exactly what their scope is. Um, we have up, up above, there's some stormwater management stuff. We actually have a completely separate general bylaw on stormwater management, um, I believe, um, that we have. It might even be referenced here. Yep, stormwater management bylaw, and there's apparently a wetlands bylaw. Um, at, at what point in this process it uh, are is it appropriate to go and pull out the stuff that's duplicative? You were talking about even the application section that has a lot of duplicative with what's already required. At what point are you are you planning on sort of pulling that duplicative stuff off and saying, you know, that's not a zoning thing at all because there's a completely other bylaw that deals with that that they have to follow anyway or water supply protection. And I don't know whether there's an actual bylaw with water supply protection, but there's a committee that does that. I don't know whether zoning bylaws in any other sense deal with water supply protection. Um, but you know, at, when, when does that sort of review of, oh, this is duplicative of X board's own bylaws and the work they're doing so we don't need it in zoning happen? Yes. So um, I agree that um, there are boards that review these things, like the Conservation Commission. I'm not um, aware that the Water Supply Protection Committee has any role in regulating land use permitting, but I could be completely wrong about that. My only interaction with them has been to receive their recommendations um, about solar installations. So I don't know how they fit into the permitting process. I know we never go to them and say, does this building in this location have a problem with water supply protection? So so that's one thing. I um, 
the, the planning board and the zoning board of appeals rely on the conservation commission to review many things having to do with certainly wetlands, but also with stormwater. But if there's no wetland on the property, then the conservation commission doesn't get involved. But on the other hand, we need to be concerned about stormwater and stormwater runoff and how do we control that. So the planning board and the ZBA do review, you know, stormwater management plans and plans that show, you know, where is the detention basin or whatever it is. Um, so I guess it sort of happens at, um, on a normal course of events because we call upon the town engineer to review plans for our boards. But um, I don't think having these things listed is hurting anything. I think it points people in the right direction and says, you know, you need to pay attention to those rules, those bylaws, those laws of the state and of the town. And, you know, you, you just need to, um, maybe we need to have them make a statement that they have um, complied with these. And it's hard to count on somebody else to review them, you know, I guess I'm not saying this very well, but the DEP stormwater handbook. Well, if you have a site that has a uh, conservation, you know, jurisdiction, then you go to the conservation commission and you say, what do you think about this? Do they comply? If you have a site that doesn't have any conservation um, jurisdiction, then we're sort of reviewing it ourselves or counting on Jason Skeels, the town engineer to review it. And sometimes the wetlands administrator helps us out, but um, I don't know. I don't think there's any harm in having all of these in here, and it made the Solar Bylaw Working Group feel better about what was being written here, because I think a lot of what they're worried about is that these installations are subject to erosion and sedimentation to the point where, you know, whole hillsides have sloughed off. So having these, the references to these laws in here was, um, was reassuring to them. Chris, this is a very quick follow-up, and then Pat D'Angelo. Um, the finding that that a, that a permit granting authority would go through, um, do their do their findings uh, look at compliance? For instance, compliance with stormwater. Does ZBA actually have a finding, or could there be a um, as part of a general condition or a list of findings, um, you must comply with stormwater management. That would be a condition. Um, okay. And yes, those could be written into conditions that um, you must comply with the DEP stormwater handbook and you must comply with the Massachusetts Wellness Protection Act, et cetera. Um, so those could be included in conditions. Yeah. Just wondered where, Pat, sorry to cut you off. I don't really have, have uh, anything important. I just want I want to remind the group here, the CRC members, the bylaw has to be followed by the ZBA and the planning board. Rules and regulations do not. So it seems to me that what we consider the most important aspects needs to be in the bylaw. And, and parsing them all out right now isn't going to work, I don't think. But I'm reiterating it because that's the issue. What are we going to allow a group of people who change over time, uh, the ability to change, and what do we think has to be um, the, the, by, the bylaw that will protect the health and safety of community members, will protect the water supply? So it, it really is uh, our responsibility to make sure that the bylaw contains what can't be changed. That's all. I'm sorry if I'm not. Thank you. Uh, Mandy Joe. Thank you, Mandy. Yeah, um, to go back to stormwater, because I'm, I'm trying to like figure out, as Pat was saying, what something like this would need versus what's covered in other 
parts of our laws already, right? <laughs> and because we don't want to duplicate or conflict. If if they have to follow two different ones and they conflict, we got problems and, and all. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on stormwater. I just pulled up the stormwater bylaw because I was curious who enforces it and who approves stuff. Um, so something like stormwater, the bylaw itself says prior to the issuance of any site plan approval or development permit for activities where the regulations apply. And we, I don't know whether solar applies or not. I haven't delved into that, but this is what my question was, when do we look at that, right? That, that the stormwater management plan must be approved by the DPW. So if, if at what point does whoever's writing our solar bylaw determine whether our general bylaw on stormwater management applies to solar large ground style solar mount installations? And if it does, doesn't the whole section that's currently in regulations essentially get deleted in favor of this one with a condition or just a statement in the application section that says you must have already received your DPW stormwater management plan approval, you know, <laughs> something like that, right? At what point, when are we making those, who's looking at that and when is that looking at before we get into say the real, you know, I don't wanna dig into stormwater management to find out after two meetings of stormwater management that, we have a general bylaw that applies to these and we only need two sentences. <laughs> you know, and, and that that's sort of where my question is going. And, and, and stormwater is easy because, you know, we were on, many of us were on the council when we went through the really difficult stormwater management general bylaws at TSO and trying to understand that. So it's just in my brain of, I know we have one, but I think like CONCOM, when, when do we do those comparisons and say, you know, that's covered by there. We only need something that says in the application section, you already have to have that permit before you come to site plan, you know, come for your special permit or how, you know, or we deal with how they get that and the timing between those two. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to phrase it. Um, I was in a similar vein, uh, if I were to look at the, ZBA rules and regulations. There are um, there are a number of just protocols, and then and then one of the items though says all lot lines, easements, properties must must apply to the the rear and side yard dimensions as set forth in Table Three of the bylaw and zoning district. So amongst all of this, you know, location of proposed trees and curb cuts is also this reference to, oh, by the way, you have to comply with table three of the dimension um, dimension table. And so it's it's kind of a combination of, of items. Um, I think it would be very helpful to be able to go through this pretty carefully and, and, and identify, as Mandy just said, where do we write in and you must have the DPW approval of your stormwater management plan, and you must have the CONCOM approval of its of of any wetland uh, infringement or something like that, and just make it part of the 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 process. So where would where would those show up if if it's not just in a, in the regular bylaw? Chris, sorry, I didn't call on you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I would say that um, interdepartmental communication is challenging, um, and we don't always know what the DPW has looked at or has approved, and if they have a permit that they give out, I'm not um, familiar with it, and so uh, I think what I've heard from the DPW is that there is a um, stormwater bylaw, but they're working on developing stormwater rules and regulations. So, um, and they have to comply with NPDES, which is national, I forget what it stands for, but it's a, like a nationwide uh, stormwater um, uh, requirement. So I guess what I'm saying is it doesn't hurt to have this list in here 
I'm fine with taking it out because these things all have to be complied with. But I I wouldn't say that um, it's completely clear to me how the DPW reviews or doesn't review um, stormwater. And often for large scale things like um, solar installations, uh, we call in a peer reviewer to review what is being proposed. So um, there's currently a large scale solar installation that's being proposed in town and the Zoning Board of Appeals is going to have the stormwater management plan for that um, project reviewed by a third party peer reviewer. I don't think we're going to rely on DPW. So um, I guess it's just, I, I guess I'm reluctant to take this list out because it says it all. It's got, you've got to comply with these things. Um, and it doesn't harm anything to have them in here since they're, it's just a list. It doesn't pick certain parts of this out and say X section of this document you must comply with. It's like, you've got to comply with all of this. Um, and as I said, right now, the, in, the intercommunication between departments is not refined enough to really make me feel comfortable just dropping this whole thing. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to make a big deal about it because we don't have this list in other sections of our zoning bylaw. We know these, um, we know these documents exist and we, you know, refer to them. And we know that our, the engineers that submit plans to us also refer to them and have to comply with them. And they stamp a plan and they're putting their professional reputation on the line if they don't comply with them. Um, so I guess this argument that I'm making is very circular. <laughs> I would prefer to leave these things in here if you feel like they should be out because there are they already exist elsewhere and you know we're sure that people comply with it all and we don't need to talk about it. Okay, but my own comfort level would be enhanced if this list were in here and all the down to the where it starts to say other documents that may be in use. Um, I think those things are, you know, materials that we could offer to somebody, but th they don't necessarily have to be complied with. But the ones up above, I would personally want to leave in, I think. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Stephanie. So again, going back to the wetlands permitting, and I'm having to recall, it's been a while, but the point at which you ask for the stormwater management plan is the point at which someone submits the application. So it's a requirement of the application that a stormwater management plan be submitted, at least in relation to the wetlands regulations, which is all I can speak to from my experience. Um, so, and the, the stormwater management plan addresses the state regulations. And then if there are additional town bylaw requirements that are then sort of on top of that, um, which is I think what DPW is working on, it would have to reference both. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, in terms of the, there was a question of when does this get called into play? So stormwater management plan requirement would be in the bylaw. As far as the submission requirements, um, then to me, that would be in the regulations of then spelling out what it is you're complying with or what you need to comply with. Um, I, I'm a little confused by the, by some of the conversation in terms of referencing sort of when does this come into play? If, a, if a, there's a, a project that falls within the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission, then they are going to be the ones, they are going to be looking at stormwater management. That is part of what they will have to do. So I think, again, spelling that out, that a stormwater management plan is required would be a thing to have in the bylaw. This other supporting documentation, again, would make sense for the regulations and be kept to be kept in the regulations. And I agree, I would lose anything that is not specific to Massachusetts or the town of Amherst. 
Um, and I don't know if that was helpful or not, but um, I, that to me would would be a way to sort of simplify the language in the bylaw versus then having it spelled out in the regulations. Thank you. A, a question that came to my mind is, if I were an applicant and I and I came to Amherst, um, what would what would make a what would make a process the easiest to understand, the easiest to follow, and the easiest to comply with? And so part of me is um, is questioning if it might not be appropriate to have a a bylaw that is intact with with much of this information actually in it when uh, not edited down, thinned out a little bit as as Stephanie just mentioned. Um, but if if I had to go to the ZBA rules and regulations and find their article five that deals strictly with solar, or if I had to go to some other entity and find their section, their subsection that deals with solar, I think it would be, I'd like to make it easy for somebody to actually do this while putting all of our, all of our uh, parameters in place so that it's done well. Um, I would love some conversation about that. It, does it make sense to have a unified solar bylaw with much of this information in it, the requirements in it, um, for simplicity's sake? Mandy. Yeah, I guess I, I want to clarify, you know, what Stephanie indicated she was concerned confused or I was not clear, I probably was not clear about sort of what my question was going about. When does the timing come in? Um, I, I guess that question relates, I think I might be able to do it better with, if, if we're on rules and regs and I don't even know whether it's our, within our purview to be dealing with rules and regs, but, but we're talking about it right now. And you you stated at the beginning the submittal requirements has application requirements and then these other thirty four that you just pulled out and stuck into here, but that some of these thirty four are probably duplicative of ZBA's application requirements in Section three point one, and so essentially my question is. Are they going to be looked at and duplicative stuff sort of removed and done before we have as a CRC a discussion on application requirements? Or are we going to be discussing these for 34 when some of them might already be in the rules and regs to begin with? At what point is this document going to be sort of cleaned up for that duplicativeness before or after we have our first serious discussion on say section on submittal requirements and and then if 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 you extrapolate that out to stormwater management before or after we have our first serious discussion on stormwater management are we going to clean up that section who is it going to be cleaned up before or after that first discussion to identify what's already covered by CONCOM's review and so doesn't need to be in a zoning bylaw or is already covered by the general bylaw and stormwater management so doesn't need to be in a zoning bylaw or maybe it's covered but you want it in any way but you've identified this is a duplicate of X, Y, or Z. I guess I'm trying to figure out the timing of that, of how we're reviewing given <laughs> that we already know at least for this section 1704, as it's indicated now, there are duplicates to something that already exists. Yes. So I can take a pass at um, the submittal requirements and see how many of these things duplicate what's in the Planning Board and Zoning Board of Appeals rules and regs. So that would sounds like it would be something helpful. I didn't have time to do that last year when we were um, reviewing this, but I can do it now and bring back a list for you next time. 
that, that would be that would be lovely. I was going to offer to help with that. Um, and so maybe we could we could sit down at the same time and do that, but that would be I don't want to hold you up. Um, at that on that note, I given that we're going to be thrashing through this in many iterations, um, I'm also going to say that I would appreciate if if every member on the committee has comments, it would be great. I would collect them and I can I can tally them and keep them going so that we just we make sure that we cover our questions and we cover our concerns um, and sort of check those check those things off that people send to me and it could be a rolling you know once we've once we've dealt with something we strike a line through it and we we keep going um, but it seems smart to have a a single point of collection rather than um, trying to track it in many different ways. But if Christine is willing to at least highlight on here, it, it could be the same manner, you know, which if if on uh, three seventeen oh four number two, the first five bullets are straight out of a uh, the planning or the ZBA. I mean, I really think we should focus on the ZBA because as of now, the recommendation is that all of this uh, is by special permit, so it would go to the ZBA. Um, I would focus on what shows up in their in their list um, as a starting point and just color code it. This is already covered. This is already covered uh, in in somebody else's document. Does that and make sense? Just say something about um, not doing it for the planning board. Just that even though we have decided that large-scale solar installations that are operating on their own or will operate on their own will be permitted by the, by the Zoning Board of Appeals. There are accessory uses, such as the one at um, Hampshire College, that because it's an accessory to an educational institution, is reviewed by the Planning Board under Site Plan Review. So I don't think we should leave the Planning Board out you know, completely, because that may happen in other instances. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Yep. So, so it could be either ZBA or planning board, and maybe by color, you could indicate which one. Maybe. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, that's very helpful to know that the planning board actually dealt with Hampshire College. Uh, Stephanie, please, and then Jennifer. Sure, and sorry not to um, go backwards a little bit, but going back to stormwater management, I just wanted to point out that it's required if it's required for CONCOM submissions if the project falls within the jurisdiction, which it may not. So I think the point and the reason why this came up and it was included in the beginning and why all these other regulations were all referenced was the concern by members that stormwater be included as a matter of course for any solar project submission. So I would be happy to do a similar process with stormwater in meeting with the wetlands administrator and maybe following up even with DPW about what they're working on to see what might make sense in terms of the kind of language that might work here as well for the bylaw itself. Would that be helpful? Oh, you're muted, Pam. Thank you. The dog was barking. Oh. <laughs> that would be helpful. Thank you, <laughs> Jennifer. Actually, Stephanie to kind of answer, just answer my question, because I was wondering whether if it when or if it needs to go before stormwater review or the conservation commission would that be indicated in the, the zba requirements or is do we have to yeah. look at all the different entities that could possibly have to review it it would should that be part of our review i'm just thinking of it like any project right any let's just say any project a building project comes before is it within the realm or the jurisdiction of these other boards and committees? It's the same thing with the solar project. 
that's the same, it should be the same questioning process of which is the entity that reviews this project in addition to the ZBA. Right. Um, so I think it's just the same questioning that you would use for the solar projects as you would in another development. Right. Thank you. Christine. So I just wanted to mention that um, the items that were listed in the first part of section 1710, stormwater management, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I went to Erin Jacques, who's the wetlands administrator and works with the Conservation Commission, and I asked her, what references should we put in our zoning bylaw to make sure that we are covered as far as, um, you know, stormwater management, erosion, and sedimentation control? And she mentioned these one, two, three, four, five documents that she thought would be helpful to have a reference to in our zoning bylaw. Um, so that's the EPA 2022 construction permit, Massachusetts DEP stormwater handbook, Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act, Town of Amherst general bylaws and Town of Amherst wetlands bylaw. She thought it would be helpful to have those listed in our bylaw. So I took her recommendation and that's why they were put in here. Um, so I'm not saying they have to stay, but I just wanted to let you know that they did come from Aaron. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Councillor Haneke. I'm curious, I, I'm going to bring us back to how are we going to review all of this and what document are we going to start with? Um, thinking about staying in lanes, the regulations are not within really CRC's purview. But I also feel like we, you know, we can't ignore them, right? But I feel like maybe we should be starting with the bylaw, um, and and getting the bylaw in shape, getting the bylaw to have everything in it, getting it in a passable form, you know, making those decisions. Like, do we just add the definitions to Article Twelve, or are they included in this Article Seventeen or whatever? And 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 concentrating much more on the bylaw than the regulation side right now. Although I, I I appreciate and have been one of the people that have been pushing this conversation on regulations about how we do it, right? But but um, should we be, and, and this is more a question for the committee, should we be sort of pausing on those regulations in that regulation review and saying, you know, that's step two. Step one is figuring out what all goes in the bylaw and then discussing the scope of the bylaw, you know, I, I know there are many things that are currently in the bylaw and some of the regulations that I want to strike. Um, and, and probably that Councillor DeAngelis wants to keep, you know, and we have to have those conversations too, right? Um, and so, so I guess my question is, what's our next step? Is it is it having Chris and Stephanie do all of this with the regulations or is it us coming back given these documents and saying, you know, I really want this part of the regulations moved over to the bylaw and then and then starting from that and then working through what what are the next steps with that? And and where are we going, say, for the next meeting or two meetings? Chris, do you want to respond or um Yeah, I, I wanted to say that I think one of the most helpful things would be deciding what did Stephanie and I put in the rules and regs that should be put back into the bylaw, and then we can look at the bylaw as a whole. That makes sense to me. So who decides what should go back into the bylaw? Do we do that in a joint session like this, or should Stephanie and I take a crack at it and bring it back next time along with the other things that we said we would do? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject here. I think, frankly, each of the, the council members should take their own look at it and and mark up their own copy and say, this really feels like it ought to be part of the bylaw. And then um, they can email me to that to me and we can have a discussion, um, you know, using everybody's notes. Um, I think I think doing a little homework before actually just sitting down one by one and, and thinking about it as we see it is not a good way to do it. Um, so I would I would suggest that perhaps a, a homework assignment for us is to do exactly that. I 
also felt that there were items that really needed to be part of a contact or, or a concise bylaw that were not necessarily regulations. Um, as, as part of that though, I think it would still be helpful if Christine goes through and says, oh, by the way, when we look at something from the ZBA or planning, planning board perspective, these items are covered in their very standard and very complete listing. I think we can do multiple multiple tasks here. Um, Councillor Ette. Um, could you repeat what the assignment is? Because I, on one hand, um, agree with Councillor Haneke that perhaps we should tackle the bylaws first. But on the other hand, I think there's a benefit to going over the rules and regulations, knowing that that is not a focus. And so we could speed through that, picking out things that are um, significant for us to bring back in. And giving those two polls, I was listening kind of to your assignment. So if you could repeat what the assignment is, then I might know where exactly I would lean between either of them. Thank you. If I, if I could clarify then, if it were me and I sat down with the printed bylaw, I would look at anything that had been um, identified as blue. And I would say to myself, is this, does this feel like a bylaw or does this feel more like a rule or regulation that, um, that I'm comfortable with? And so each, each of us personally should go through and, and grapple with that you can either write it down yourself or bring your own marked up copy or you can email it to me and then it would be it would be a much quicker conversation to go through then the, the the list um as a committee um and we would be able to go through fairly quickly to see if most of us agreed with item 10 11 and 12 should really go back into the bylaw and we all nod and go great those go back into the bylaw 13, 14, and 15 really still appear to be uh, regulation. Let's let's label it as such. Um, that that to me would speed it up rather than just hearing noises. Um, oh, okay. Um, does that make sense? Could I follow up? So yeah, I was looking at you. You didn't realize it. Okay. <laughs> so we, we are speaking about the initial document that had the entire bylaws color coded and looking through, as you said, grapple is the word you use. So grapple with these color codes and see what we could bring into the bylaw okay may i say something yeah. yeah all the blue things are contained in a document and all the pink things are contained in a document and all the yellow things and all the green things they each have their separate document they're not color coded but they're um, all put together so it might be easier to look at those separate documents and mark things that think that you think this isn't a rule and reg this should go back in the bylaw because i think when you start looking at that document that has all those colors on it some of the the writing isn't clear and it's just all a big jumble that's what i would suggest just look at the the white black and white documents that represent each of those sections that we talked about specifically bylaw and rules and regs and figure out what in the rules and regs document do you think should go back in the bylaw? That would be my recommendation. Thank you. Very good one. Uh, Councillor Haneke. Thank you. And I just want to clarify one other thing. Um, at this point, our opinion on whether we would just delete it completely or modify it extensively should not come into this review. Um, we're dealing with whatever the original language was and saying if that language is kept, it should be here or there, not my particular opinion of, well, I would get rid of the language completely, for example, um, or I would change it X, Y, or Z. That, it, that, that's, that's 
the task, right? No matter yeah. our thoughts on the language. Not editing yet. Yeah. Okay. As much as, I mean, obviously you're going to make your own little edits. So you can do what you want, but it wouldn't be at that next meeting that we would discuss it. Right. Okay. Good. Um, anything, anything else? I, uh, it's now eight o'clock and uh, we have two other items. Actually, probably only one, but um, we needed to discuss we needed to discuss um, just a quick update on the planning board. Ooh. I'm sorry, I'm being distracted here. <laughs> Is there a nice, seems like there's a dog or animal there. Dog, dog. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. I see people with cats on them tonight. It's, it's my turn. Um, So do are we are we clear with Christine and Stephanie if there's anything that they're um so should we try and get this to you by next do we have a deadline for our homework? <laughs> I think we should come to the meeting prepared and we'll try and get it to you before. If you, wanna, if you if you wanna send it to me ahead of time, okay. that would be great. If you do not get at least have gone through it yourself and be ready to talk about it, it would be would be wonderful. Uh, and I don't have a calendar in front of me, but I'm trying to remember the the next um, PRC meeting. It is the 15th. Is that right? 14th or 15th? The 14th. Stephanie or Christine, any questions? Have we left you hanging? My question is just whether um you still want us I, I think you did want Chris to still look at the duplicative language and then wondering if you would like me to still follow up on the stormwater issue in terms of what would be required happy to do that, that would be, that's very helpful yeah I mean we we can be dealing with a couple different aspects of it and then bring it together okay Good. so I would say thank you very much to Christine and Stephanie for spending time with us and uh, we look forward to more meetings with you Hopefully we'll keep them as short as possible. One one other item on that topic though is um, at some point as we, um, we've talked a little bit about engaging other staff reviews. And I think I would love to hear back maybe at the next meeting um, when it feels appropriate to have a, at what point might we have a document that in fact could go to different committees and or departments for some feedback on actual content. Since we're not dealing with content yet, it doesn't seem, as Mandy pointed out way back when, it doesn't seem uh, fair to saddle them with, with trying to add, edit and add material um, until we have something that's a little more polished. So I'd love some feedback on that at the next meeting. Thank you. And thanks very much for spending time. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Jennifer, do you want to give a quick um, overview of, of our planning board? I think we're really talking about sufficiency of pool because we have talked about interview questions. We have talked about guidance um, and the the description of all about the planning board still stands. So we're really we're really talking about sufficiency of pool. Yes. Um, so right now we have four active applicants. Um, two of those who had previously submitted CAFs when uh, Pam reached out to them and they indicated that they were no longer interested. They were probably on other boards or committees. And then two um, people that had previously submitted CAFs didn't, but they needed to submit new ones. Have they? They've received an invitation to do that, and they have not submitted CAFs. So right now we have four that have um, responded that they're interested and have submitted a CAF. And have you? Um, it's I don't know if people have looked to see who those people are in SharePoint, but I would say the fact that we only have four, 
we were probably would not say that was sufficient. And in terms, I would say there are three men and one woman. I would say the diversity is, you know, I, I would I think we could we would probably agree that we need to continue to do outreach. But so right now we have four for two spots. Three men and a woman. Councilor Haneke. Yeah, um, I I wouldn't call the pool sufficient. I don't think we can declare it sufficient. It's too early anyway because the vacancy notice hasn't been up for two weeks yet, um, and it has right. to be up but for fourteen is. days before yeah. you can do anything. <laughs> um, so un under our our policy. So, but yeah, I I know two and four. A lot of times you'd say yes, but but I'd I'd love to leave this open a little bit longer, simply because it hasn't been up very long and people don't necessarily know that we're seeking applicants. Um, have what kind of outreach has been done with the bulletin board notice going up? Have have did it when it went up? Did it go out on sort of those in the news sort of email lists? and stuff that do, do we know whether it went out to people who subscribe to like news lists the 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 town news list yeah <laughs> I, I i think it's called in the news or this or that that the manager generally sends his own press release out for when he's seeking and vacancies for everything else have we done that for planning board yet i don't think so I, I would recommend we do that before we consider closing a pool it's, I mean, it's on the bulletin board, but I don't know who on earth even looks at the bulletin board uh, for that kind of announcement. Um, I, I can reach out to the, the town manager if that is, I mean, obviously it's something he's responsible for filling his, his committees. This is not his committee. Um, and maybe, maybe mm -hmm. that's. In the past, if I've reached out, he's he's been able to figure out. I don't know. It used to be Brianna. I don't know who does those those automated emails that that his go out for. I've seen his go out with town manager seeking applicants for these twelve boards. Right. I don't think a planning board one has gone out. I think you have to contact him and ask him. He normally sent me to Brianna. I don't know who he'd send me to <laughs> or he'd send you guys to, but I'd, I'd request that, that that get out there in the next week or so, if we could work on that. I mean, we've sent a notice to our district mailing list. You know, we, we do kind of monthly bulletins and it's been on did, there. Did but that's just our district. I know, I, I know it was announced at the town council meeting last night but did you send the link to the bulletin board notice to the council so they could so they know there's a bulletin board notice i actually didn't realize there was a bulletin board notice out um, at all um because i haven't seen it come through on anything so the other it was posted last week yeah no it was i i just looked and i saw it because I, I was like we can't do anything unless the bulletin board notice is posted but it's posted but i'm not sure the rest of the council that's not on this committee even realizes that the notice has been posted despite last night's announcement during committee reports that we've started the process, sending an email to the council that says, here's the bulletin board notice, please let your things could be very helpful too. Yep, good idea. Good idea. And I don't know, uh, Councillor Ette, I don't know if Dona has any kind of meeting coming up, but that's also a, a, a very good way to get the word out. Some people saw the bulletin board notice because we got like two calves immediately after it went up, two or three. Yeah. I mean, a one, it, like a week and a half ago, it seemed like we had seven or eight, but then four people either declined or didn't respond. And they may respond. I mean, I right. like send them a little, a little tickler saying, you know, I reminded you to send in a new calf. Please do it if you're still interested. We would love to have you. So, um, Councillor Ette. So thanks for the reminder. Um, Dona has 
some, I think, small events this weekend. And so I'll be able to pitch in and see what comes out of it. Thank you. And and just of note that there are two two people whose terms end and that we are we are seeking uh, a good pool of people to select from. Great. I think that kind of wraps it up. Those are really good suggestions on how to how to outreach. Um, and our thank goal you. is, you know, July 1st is when we hope they'll be seated. Yeah, so so thank you. I was that that was the thought that evaporated. Um, working backwards, we want to have the council um, have a chance to vote on the the recommendations by by when mid mid June. It'd be nice to not do it at the very last minute. I'm looking at, at Andy. She looks like she's looking at her calendar. Oh, Jennifer. No, I was just wondering, since the planning board chair, <clears throat> excuse me, did um, for the criteria, he had a suggestion. It's in our packet to change one of the paragraphs. Do we need to vote on that? Question. Yeah. Yeah, we have the, the policy requires we adopt selection criteria every every time. Um, there's a scheduled town council meeting on Monday, June 17th. Um, there's probably a tentative one, although it's I, my count, my calendar has it on June 24. That is generally there to give us an extra week to adopt a budget. It, depending on how things go, I don't know whether that's a solid June 24 meeting is happening, but June 17 is happening because <laughs> that's one of our regular council meetings. So that's probably the one we should probably aim for to be have recommendations in by. So our our interviews would be the I mean the 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 second half of May would be appropriate, which is coming up soon. <laughs> or early June, yeah. Or early June, right. Right. Okay. So we'll we'll try to target that and um and I may look to uh, Jennifer to help yeah, with not do that. that bulletin board announcement. Um, I am going to try to keep my access to my computer going here. Um, our last topic is, and I don't, sorry, I don't have the agenda right in front of me, but our last topic was the nuisance bylaw. And I, Jennifer, did you actually hear back from Anna? Um, I spoke with Lynn, I guess I wasn't able to reach Anna and just Lynn is on GOL. Well, as is Et, uh, um, Councilor Ette. So what you can. Great. Yay. Councilor Ette. <laughs> um, so I actually, I think, chaired the last meeting we had for GOL. And what we decided to do is to see if we could get some questions from members of the committee just to ask of the chairs of CRC regarding um, the nuisance bylaw. And I think that's what we are going to do. I um, don't know if any questions have been sent to Athena or um, to Anna, but that would be the route that we are going to go instead of having it return to CRC. Okay, can I make sure I understand? So, GOL discussed the bylaw. I mean, the 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 document, um, the bylaw, um, and that that questions were raised that are going to come to us to answer. So we didn't discuss it. We discussed the process we would take, and the process would be that we would send questions to Athena or Anna. And those would be questions that could then be sent to the chairs of uh, CRC. Okay, so I should expect to see perhaps a list of questions. Um, I'm going to ask Mandy if somebody sends a list of questions to me um, and I don't necessarily know the answer or don't want to reply without 
without um, legal, you know, sort of legal footing. Um, is it possible for us to, as a either as a committee or as a, like I call you and say, Mandy, what about question number two? Um, I would like the latitude to be able to discuss it necessarily. I'm not going to answer all these questions by myself is what I'm boiling down to. Yeah, no, if, if you get a list of questions, you can either put it on a CRC meeting for us to discuss to as a committee as a whole responses, or if uh, who knows what these questions would look like, right? Um, um, if they're fairly basic and you feel like you can answer most of them, um, on your own, but have a question with one or two, it's, it's it's perfectly fine for you to consult one CRC member before answering them. I'd be concerned with more than one because then you get into sort of potential deliberations. But as long as they all just come to you, uh, okay. come from you to the committee back. But it, it, when you see them, you might be like, oh, CRC needs to discuss this. <laughs> you know I mean? it, it might be pretty obvious when you get them and might not. Who knows? Yeah. Good. Jennifer. Well, yeah, no. <clears throat> so GOL received the nuisance bylaw with KP Law's comments. And they're, they definitely be go, go beyond their substantive. It goes beyond what's clear, concise, and actionable. So does so if it's beyond the purview of GOL, do they have and they want it to come to they want CRC to address those comments from KP law that are not clear, concise, and actionable, but substantive, does GOL just procedurally have to send it back to the, go back to the council and then ask the council to refer it to us? Or can it just can happen it? by an email to the chair? I'm looking at Councillor Ette and also at Councillor Haneke. <laughs> So we've been wrestling with this, actually, and I was going to ask that as a question to um, Councillor Rooney. Um, one of the options we had, and it was actually, we considered it quite a bit, was to simply refer the bylaw to CRC, since the comments that were made by KP Law were substantive. Um, Athena mentioned that as the body that looks over legislation, GOL should be able to make um, the necessary edits. And so we moved away from that and returned to having a list of questions that we would send to um, CRC. But in listening to the discussion right now, if the questions end up coming before the committee itself. I don't, I think it would be more efficient to simply have it return to CRC to look over it because there's practically no difference between having questions answered within the committee and having the committee look at the bylaw with Oh, yes, the nuisance bylaw with the comments that are made by KP Law. I don't know if that makes sense. If I understand you, if if it comes back to CRC, it would come back with questions that would that would want answering. Um, and then CRC would um, edit appropriately and come back with the document that GOL could then look at again. So there are two options, both of them are going to involve the entire committee. So one would be questions that the committee discusses, or another would be that it's referred back to CRC and it wouldn't be questions, but we would look over everything, make the necessary necessary updates, and then send it back to Joel. Oh, Mandy. So it's complicated, right? Because our committee structure is not potentially set out properly to deal with this situation. But I'm gonna bring us back to um, rental registration. After CRC 
pushed it out and said, we're done with it with a recommendation that it go to finance for looking at specific areas. Finance struggled with it for a while and basically sent questions directly back to CRC who then answered them and sent those answers along with amendments to the bylaw back to finance directly. Um, and the council didn't have a problem with that. So, um, um, you know, I, I think I think the question approach at this point, given the um, uncertainty and the confusing nature of how our committee charges are set up to review bylaws and work on bylaws, I think the question system of sending questions from the committee that it's got reviewed to another committee and say, hey, can you do that? Can you answer these questions is the most logical and probably most efficient at this time. TSO does it all the time with sending questions to TAC for reviews and advice while they're looking at stuff without a formal referral to TAC or anything. They just send them on. So I think there's precedent for doing it that way. Um, and it's probably the most efficient if GOL is having issues to do it that way, given how our committee structure is set up. Thank you. So we could we could address the vice chair of GOL and suggest that GOL um, send back the document with with questions and any any markups, any questions. And that would put it back on our on our table to discuss. And we would be, I would be very happy to discuss it. Duly noted. Pat. Separate issue. So if uh, we're not done with this discussion, I can wait. That wraps it up. Does everybody feel comfortable with that approach? Martha Hanner has her hand up. Oh, she's one I of two. Sorry. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm yes, and I did say before that we would go back for um if, if there was no public comment at the beginning, nobody had raised their hand. Thank you. And thank you, Pat, for saying that. Um I I haven't had that open. Um I'm very happy to have Martha Hannah make it Hannah make any comments. Um, I'm guessing it's about the solar bylaw. Are you reopening public comment? Uh, no, I'm taking some comments on the solar bylaw. That I we... think you have to reopen public comment for everyone who's in the audience if they wish to comment. I'm reopening public comment. It is 20 after 8, and um, I see a hand in the audience. Could someone bring Martha Hanner in, please? Hmm. All right. Thank you. This is Martha Hanner. I live in District 5, and I was a former member of the Solar Bylaw Working Group, but it has disbanded, and so I'm speaking strictly as an individual. I thank you all for giving your attention to the bylaw. I wanted to say a couple of things that, as uh, Jennifer pointed out, and I thank you all others too, that anything we want to ensure will be a requirement, has to be in the bylaw, since uh, the planning board or the ZBA can set their own regulations and so on. I'd also like to say that I think we want to make it as easy as possible for developers in the sense that, you know, how many different permits from different departments do they have to have? Uh, can they go to just one document, namely the solar bylaw, to see what all the requirements are without having to track down, a, you know, a dozen different places and different zoning laws and so on? Uh, also for the ZBA, you know, how many things do they have to track? Uh, can they just turn to the solar bylaw and uh, have everything pretty much laid out there that that is is quote important, shall we say? Uh, for that. And so I would say that from the solar bylaw working group, the erosion and the conserving the soils and, you know, stormwater management and that whole category was really 
something that was important and we debated for quite a while and, and showed a lot of concern. If you folks are not familiar with what happened in Williamsburg, please investigate before your next time. <laughs> because, uh, you know, as we've seen, and Councillor Haneke, we've seen this on a small scale right in our own neighborhood twice now, where a developer just comes in with a bulldozer and just clear cuts and grades and smooths the entire property right up to the borders of the property, never mind the erosion or the this or the that, so that uh, requirements about buffer zones or gradients and so on really are important to have in a bylaw somewhere, however you manage to figure it out. And then I would just like to suggest to, to Pam that I could see where it would be helpful if you could ask your fellow council members to send their comments in advance so that you could kind of uh, draw them together as much as possible. And it may be if, if several people feel a similar way, you'd be able to draw it up into a coherent um, you know, language right in advance to shorten the discussion and then have, have things uh, focused, I certainly, I uh, look forward to hearing about it. Unfortunately, I have a conflict on the 14th of May. I can't come. But uh, also then on the battery storage, I want to emphasize that our solar working group never had the opportunity to discuss the battery storage section. It kept being postponed and postponed until the very last day when we were under pressure to approve the, the final draft. And you know everybody said, oh, we you know, can't approve anything because we've never discussed it. So that's why the battery storage section was was not really fleshed out in the document. And there are some important things, I think, that that might be considered to include. So thank you. And thank you for all your good work on this. Thank you, Martha. Very helpful. Appreciate it. Uh, is there anyone else in the audience that would I'm having trouble opening it here. That would like to speak, please raise your hand. Don't see anybody. Okay. Okay. Um, future agenda items. I think solar bylaws in our future would we'll include that. <laughs> nuisance <laughs> questions. The nuisance bylaw questions. Yep. Bylaw. Right, thank you. And planning board. Yep. Mandy. So the planning board has been discussing a whole lot of University Drive potential rezoning or additional zoning. Uh, are we ever going to weigh in on that discussion before they potentially bring something to the council? Do we want to, as a committee, have a presentation on that and a discussion. That's question number one. And question number two is, the consultant is working on design guidelines for downtown right now. Are they ever going to come to CRC to see what CRC's thoughts are on design guidelines in downtown before their work is done during their fact-finding and consulting stage before they've drafted a bylaw? I would love them to be here to talk to the entire committee on and I, my understanding is they're talking to residents. Why are they not talking to us? Good question. <laughs> Great, good question. Jennifer. No, I, I would love for them to talk to us. That, I mean, so could we just make that request? And do we have to go through the town manager? Probably. Yeah. And copy Chris Bressrup. Since, since I think her staff is managing that project, that's a very good. That's a very good question. I will. I will write a, a request for that. Pass that along. Thank you. Anything else, Pat, Councilor Ette? Uh, I have no. Um, I'm, this is for memory. I don't have anything within forty-eight hours that I'm aware of, and it looks like it is eight twenty-nine. I think it's a really good time to. Um, adjourn. Um, do we have to vote? I'll move to adjourn. Second. That's it. Thank you. Okay, we're going to quickly go. Panicky. Aye. 
Rooney, aye. D'Angelo. Aye. Taub. Aye. Okay. Aye. Okay. Can someone hit stop recording and we're done. Thank you, everybody. And thank, and thank you. you for jumping in the car and <laughs> yeah, really, really. thank you all. Bye bye. Bye bye. Feel better, Pat.